Let's sing together and worship the Lord, if you will. Once you turn to 105, would you please stand with me? We'll sing all four verses. We will glorify the King of Kings. Sing it out from the first notes. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him. on the third. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Now, if you'll turn back uh, to 63. 63 this morning, we'll sing all five verses here of all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia. Alleluia. Oh, praise Him. Praise Him. Let's sing together. All creatures of our God and the King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Rushing wind, thou rushing wind that art so strong, we clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise him, alleluia, thou rising morning, praise rejoice, in lights of evening find a voice. Fourth, and all ye men of tender heart, forgiving others, take your part. Oh, sing ye, Alleluia, ye who long pain and sorrow bear. Praise God and on him cast your care. Oh, praise him. Creator bless. Let all the bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son.
Amen. What a great song to begin with this morning. That's one of those songs on the verses you want to kind of clap out the syllables, you know, because I, I get all mixed up. And I, how does that go? And then, but what a great song. What a good chorus. Praise the Lord. The Lord is worthy to be praised, isn't he? And uh, I don't know how you couldn't praise the Lord with a weekend like this. Picture perfect. Don't you love when the humidity just goes bye-bye? And uh, how many of you would like to say bye-bye to the humidity the rest of the summer? Just go away. Don't come back. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But uh, we know that's not going to necessarily happen. We can pray that it happens, but uh, we know it won't happen. And it's good to see you, though. Thanks for coming out. We are rejoicing in the Hastings household. We have a graduate. Trent has graduated, so praise the Lord. We're, the, we're, we're very happy about that. <laughs> I've been talking about it. We've been, you know, making reference to it, and now it has finally happened. So it's kind of a surreal time for us. We're glad that he has graduated officially from high school. And uh, tomorrow morning, Lord willing, he'll start putting applications in for summer jobs before he goes off to college and, and uh, wants to keep himself busy this summer. But we're proud of him and thankful for what God has done and is doing in his life. It's good to have my in-laws here, Heather's parents, Brenda and Rich, also much better known as Grampy and Nana. So we're glad to have them with us and uh, be sure you say, Hello to them. They've been a blessing. It's been good to have them here. They don't get to come here very often, and uh, it's probably been a number of years, I think four or five years since they were here last. So it's good to have them, and it's been good to catch back up uh, with that family and uh, with my folks. And uh, I also see that uh, we have some folks here from Colorado, from Englewood, and uh, visiting here, I got to meet Joshua, Susie, and William just before the service. So make sure you say hello to them. And uh, when I see new folks, I always like to know where they're from. And uh, we would have loved that they were right here locally, but that's okay. We'll take them even if they're visiting from far away. And uh, we have some recent new members from Colorado. So maybe we can catch up and see what we know about uh, the areas and all that sort of thing. But uh, what a blessing to be together. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this service. Father, we thank you for the time together to be here, and Lord, we pray that uh, you would meet with us in every aspect of this service. I pray that it would be a help and an encouragement and a blessing to all. Lord, thank you for being a good and gracious God. You are worthy to be praised, and Lord, we look to you today. We ask that you would lead, guide, and direct in every aspect of this service and in each one of our lives, and I pray that we would keep our eyes on you. There's so much in this world we can get our eyes on that would draw us away or stress us out uh, or, Lord, could cause us to think wrongly. Help us just to look to you and keep our hearts and minds focused on you. We thank you for your love for us. May we dwell on that today, and may you have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would. They have in their hand a visitor welcome packet of information and a pen. And we have several other visitors here today as well. And, uh, and so sometimes I'll call out visitors that I just met because I still have their names fresh in my mind. It doesn't mean that you're not important. If you're visiting here today, we want to let you know that you're, you're valued and we're glad to have you as our honored guest today. Raise your hand if you would if you're visiting for the first time. We want to give to you uh, one of these visitor welcome cards and a pen from our church and in just a moment as the offering plate comes by we'd like to encourage you to fill out all the information on the card and then drop it in the offering plate and uh, that way we can make a record of your visit we want to know who you are and uh, we hope we'll get that opportunity here after the service my wife and i will be in the lobby and we'll look forward to hopefully talking to you then uh, i have a few announcements i want to make mention of this is not in the bulletin uh, but I am going to have just a brief nursery workers meeting right after the service, if we can, uh, right here uh, in the auditorium. And if you could, uh, any of our ladies who work in the nursery, if you could just kind of sit right up in the first couple rows about five to ten minutes after the service. It, it won't take long. We'll do it quick. It's not a big, you know, drawn out meeting. Just a few things we want to communicate very quickly. And then we'll uh, let you go on your way. So we'll try to move things along quickly today. For that reason. Uh, also, you'll see in the bulletin that uh, we're having the graduation party for Trent next Saturday. That'll be from noon to four. Want to encourage all of our church family to come. Uh, so far, 
Saturday weather looks good, so we're thankful for that. But rain or shine, we're having it. We'll, be in the, uh, we'll all be in the fellowship hall if it is raining, but uh, right now it looks like rain before, rain after, but Saturday looks good. So we'll pray that it stays that way, and we want to encourage you. Come, let's uh, just enjoy one another in time of fellowship. We'll have all the food for you, and we just want to uh, let Trent know we're happy that he's graduated, and it's time to kind of celebrate him as he moves on and follows the Lord and God's will for his life. So we'll look forward to having you here. I think most who are planning to come have signed up. If you haven't, you can just sign up on the back table. That would help us to know how many to prepare for. We'd sure appreciate it if you could do that. And as our ushers make their way forward, let me mention something else. Our midweek service this week is on Thursday night, not Wednesday night. That's a change. Almost every week, our midweek service is on Wednesday night, but this week it's on Thursday night, and the reason for that is because a singing group from West Coast Baptist College will be with us, and uh, they're going to come with a college group of college students that will sing, and Brother and Mrs. Weaver will be with us, and he'll be bringing the evening message. And uh, so, we want you to come Thursday. And I said this Wednesday night, sometimes when you change a midweek service, People in their mind, they, they get confused or they just think, oh, there's not a Wednesday night service, and they forget what you said. And the, what, what I'm saying is there is a midweek service. It's just on Thursday night. So please don't make the fact that we changed it from Wednesday to Thursday keep you from showing up. We want everyone to come, like usual, and come on Thursday, okay? So I'm going to keep just hitting that nail on the head. There's a midweek service, and it's on Thursday night. And we're going to make the pot a little sweeter if we can all those who are college age or younger, all the way down to toddler age, if you're here Thursday night, you get free ice cream afterwards at Brewster's, okay? So that's a pretty good deal. Uh, free ice cream. You can come to Brewster's afterwards with the group from West Coast, and we're going to look forward to that. We want to try to get as many teenagers here, especially as possible, as there are young people who are considering college and the next step of God's will for them. And uh, so we always like to do that. Let's come on out Thursday. It'll be a great time together, and there'll be good music. Now, you might be here and say, well, I'm not going to college. I'm not a young person. The service is for everybody, okay? So young and old, there's going to be good preaching for everyone. There's going to be good music that you'll all be blessed by. So uh, Thursday, 7 o'clock. We'll look forward to being here together for that time. It's time for us to collect the morning offering. Brother Richard Johnson, would you pray for that, please?
Would you take your hymnals this morning again and turn to number 510, 510, and we'll stand once again, if you're able to do that easily this morning and as we sing, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's sing about salvation this morning. If you're glad to be saved, sing out this morning. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. If you will now turn to 121, or you can look on the back of your bulletin. The back of your bulletin will have a chorus here for the month of June. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's sing this here together. We'll sing the first verse if you're looking there. If you know it, sing it with me. Sing it once more. Oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace. Take a moment, 
greet those around you. Junior church children, you can be dismissed. our way back to our seats. Let's take our hymnal or our bulletin. Let's sing through this course one more time. Oh Lord, our God, our majesty is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our God, our majesty is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name.
But there's something about that name Jesus, Jesus, Jesus There's just something about that name Master, Savior, Jesus like the fragrance after the rain Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Let all heaven and earth proclaim Kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name. Well, amen. Aren't you thankful for the name of Jesus? We're in Matthew chapter number six this morning. Thank you, Shannon. There is just something about that name, especially if you know the person who has that name. And what a wonderful special. I really appreciate that. That was a blessing. While you're turning there, a couple of things. First of all, this is almost certainly my fault because I turned the lights on in here this morning. But uh, Matt, we're missing a row of lights up here. And I think I'm the one who missed turning it on. So we might go through some channels of lights going on and off, but there's uh, one of the front, no, nope, not those ones. There we go. And now we're missing the, these ones over here. If, if we can get whatever those ones are on the side over there, then I think we'll be good. So, um, and then while he's getting that, let me also mention, and I forgot to do this during the visitor uh, time, but we do have a new visitor here today. And uh, little Gage is here in the back. And uh, so Laura, we're so happy for you. Good to have little Gage back there. And as I always say, my go-to joke when I announce the new babies in church is they're already sleeping in church, and uh, so they're good Baptists. Amen? And, uh, but anyway, and uh, we're glad to, to have him and glad to have you here, Laura. And uh, we pray and trust that uh, he's doing well. Maybe these lights are just out. I don't know. All right. Well, at least we got the ones ab above me on, so that's good. And uh, be sure you welcome little gauge and it's good to have them here. We're in Matthew chapter number six. We're going to begin reading in verse 25. Matthew chapter six. We're continuing now in our series on Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. And here the Bible says, Matthew six, verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I want to preach for a few moments this morning about trusting God's provision. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning to be gathered together here. I pray that this 
message would resonate with us. You are a good God. You are a providential God, and I pray that we'd see that. Help us not to forget it. And I pray, as a result of your providence, that we could approach life differently. Perhaps less stressed, more trusting, more at ease and at peace. Looking to you, and Lord, of of course, not being lazy or irresponsible, but just knowing that you're in control, sovereign and all-sufficient. Help us with these thoughts. May they encourage us. And Lord, may we do exactly what your word has instructed us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, this is a subject that can convict me from time to time because uh, I am not the most easygoing person around. Uh, at times I can be that way, but most of the time I, I tend to kind of live by my feelings, and sometimes I can get stressed. Any of you get stressed? Nah, you never get stressed. That's why you're such a good church. But I sometimes get stressed, and I can be affected by that. If there's a lot to do, if there's much to be accomplished, if there are, uh, you know, events on the horizon that we know are going to demand a lot of us, you know how it goes. Sometimes it can just cause us to not be at ease, and it can bring about tension in our lives. And tension can lead to even physical difficulties, like hypertension and blood pressure and ulcers and you name it, probably in some way, shape, or form, every physical ailment can relate back to uh, maybe how we're dealing with difficulty and how we're dealing with stress in our lives. There's certainly no shortage of things to be concerned about. Some of us have big concerns like, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to send my children to college? Will I lose my job? Will there be enough food on the, you know, the gro- in the grocery store or on the grocery stands? Will my family ever be saved? But then there's also smaller concerns just about day-to-day life. Uh, you know, what am I going to eat today? Or, you know, am I going to be able to uh, meet that friend? Or am I going to be able to make it to work on time? And just little day-to-day things that add up over a lifetime. And if we're not careful, we can just find ourselves getting caught up living like that. And I would dare say this morning from this passage, the Lord doesn't want us to live that way. He's not called us to live uh, hyper and tense and intense and stressed. What he wants us to do is he wants us to rest in him. And we need to learn that. And we need to cultivate that in our lives. And while gaining victory over anxiety won't necessarily promise us a a long life or a problem-free life, it can and will cause us to be Christ-honoring in how we live. And that's what I want. I want to be just Christ-honoring in how I live and in how I go about my day-to-day life. As the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And I can't live as Christ when I am living uh, full of all my issues and all of my problems. I have to give those over to God, and I have to follow Him and allow Him to lead me day by day. And this can be done. If we'll take this passage that Jesus preached many, many years ago to His disciples and a number of others, and we apply it in our lives, uh, we can look more like the Christian that we're supposed to be. And that's what this is all about. We're all about trying to become more like the Lord Jesus and be the Christians that he has called us to be. I need that. You need that. We all do. What is the problem then? Why do we struggle with this? Well, I believe we read about it right in verse 25 as we begin. Look at it again. There the Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. I think in this verse we can see right away that it's our tendency to be consumed with us. And that's where the problems begin. 
When life is lived for oneself, we are not living life correctly. Certainly not as God has called us to live it. And yet as we look around and we see what's happening in the world around us, many are doing just that. It's all about them. It's all about me. It's all about mine and myself and my brand and my business and my bottom line and on and on it goes. And, you know, my profile and my pictures and, you know, the way I appear, uh, my appearance to the world and, you know, my friends and my friend list and my groups that I associate with. And people just are so consumed with self these days. And it's by no surprise that people are as anxious and concerned and as stressed out as they have ever been. We've not been called to live for ourselves. And there is a way that we can go about learning not to do that. And just from this passage, I want to give several thoughts about how we can live the stress-free life, the life of trusting in God, rid ourselves of worry, and go around with this thought in mind. I am too blessed to be stressed. Isn't that good? Let's all say that together. Ready? I am too blessed to be stressed. I'll say it like you mean it this morning. All right. All together. Ready? I am too blessed to be stressed. Are you? We like to say it together in unison, but are we? I think if we'll take an honest look at ourselves, we'd be able to say, I absolutely am far too blessed to live a stressed, worryful life life. How do we do this? Well, here's the first thought, and that's this. Abandon yourself or abandon ourselves. The best thing that all of us can do to simply forget about ourselves, and especially what we think we need, is to get our mind off of us. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China and founder of what is today known as the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, he gave this excellent advice. <clears throat> he said, let us give up our work our plans, ourselves, our lives, our loved ones, our influence, our all right into God's hand. And then, when we have given all over to him, there will be nothing left for us to be troubled about. That's good. Hudson Taylor knew a thing or two about that. He lost a couple of wives and children on the mission field. He labored for years before he ever even saw converts, but he stayed at it. He kept faithful, and the Lord blessed his life. Verse 26 here in our passage speaks specifically of the needs of food and clothing. At the end of verse 25, he says, Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. <coughs> Vedeth them, <coughs> excuse me, are ye not much better than they? Our Savior, I think, has a sense of humor. He talks about birds being fed. They're taken care of. They have their needs met. And many of you, maybe if you were paying attention in your yard this spring, maybe you had a nest of birds. Anyone have a nest of birds? And uh, <coughs> It's amazing to me how nature, how God designed nature specifically to care for even the smallest, most helpless of creatures. And in our bush in front of our front porch, we have a holly bush, and there was a, uh, I think it was a robin. No, it was a cardinal. Cardinal uh, came, and I think the last few years we've had <coughs> cardinals nesting in that bush, and that's what they do. They come back, you know, if, if the ones that were born there live on to adulthood, they'll come back and build a nest in the same place. For the last several years, we've had cardinals in that bush. And when you see them first born, they look like the most helpless little creatures. This is a little pink skin. And sometimes I say to myself, how is that even a bird? That just looks like a little blob. And it seems to be moving around and its head's, you know, going back and forth. And, uh, and I say to myself, now, and maybe you did this as a child. Maybe you tried to take a little bird in, you know, and care for it. And I, I, can, t I can do this. Or, you know, you, if you touch one of those birds, it's not going to live for very long. And yet the mama bird knows exactly what to do. The mama bird can keep those little bags of pink skin and tufts of feathers out of their head alive. And it, it amazes me. You'd think, well, we could do a much better job than a bird could. Oh, no, God has designed nature 
just that way. And, and the adult bird can get the worm and feed the baby bird. And week after week, they get bigger. And before long, they're, they're full of feathers and they're ready to be pushed out of the nest. God has worked all this in his design plan. And yes, the mama bird takes care of the baby birds, but ultimately God has them taken care of, doesn't he? God's in control here. God has all of this under control. And we need to trust him. If he can take care of the birds, he can take care of us. If he cares for the birds, the Bible says that he knows when a sparrow falls, then he cares for us. And we need to relinquish that to the Lord. I think our Savior has a sense of humor, maybe even a smile on his face when he spoke the words of verse 26 about being fed. Your father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? I think if we will worry less about food, we won't have to be as concerned and worried about the next verses that talk about raiment. <laughs> we don't have to wear as much or get new clothes, right? Which of you, he says in verse 27, by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. God has designed our lives so that everything perfectly fits together. And, and we worry, forgetting how much God is actually in control. Uh, one lady said, oh, uh, don't tell me worry doesn't accomplish anything. Every time I worry, the things I worry about never come to place. They never work out, so I'm just going to keep on worrying. No, that's not why they didn't turn out and why they didn't come to, to happen. It's because many times the things we worry about are just that, things that won't happen, things that don't come to place. And we spend our lives maybe even wasting years of our life in concerning our heart and our mind about things that the Lord has said, I have those under my control. Why are you worried? Why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you spending yourself uh, and spinning yourself like this? <laughs> I like how the Bible says about the lilies. They toil not, neither do they spin. They're not there all worked up and worried about how they're going to look. God just makes them beautiful. The Lord's in control of that. They don't spin. We live our lives much differently, don't we? Sometimes like a hamster on a wheel. We're just spinning and we're spinning and we're spinning. Uh, we're spinning our own wheels, going nowhere and accomplishing nothing. Remember those fidget spinners? I, I meant to do, I was going to ask Trent for his so I could use it as an illustration. He's got a high-tech one. He's got one that has gears in it, so it really moves. You know, it can just spin forever. You know, uh, I don't think those are much a thing anymore, but it was a craze there about maybe five, six, seven years ago. And, uh, and the kids everywhere coming off the bus, they were, you know, doing their fidgeting and spinning those things. And, you know, maybe we should go back to that rather than the phones and the technology. Just, boom, you know, I think I'd like that a lot better. And sometimes our lives are just like that. They're spinning in a circle. We're just going about doing things, but we're really not getting anything accomplished. And we're scurrying and hurrying the here, there, and everywhere. But, but we're not trusting God in any of it. We need to perfectly trust God. We need to give everything over to him. I'm thankful that the Lord doesn't give us the ability to know what will happen in the future. If I knew that what was going to happen, my mind wouldn't be able to handle it all. But God purposely keeps that from us. Some people say, Pastor, I'd like a time machine so I could time travel. That's good for movies. It would be terrible for real life, I promise you. You wouldn't want to go into the future and see what's going to happen. And as much as you think the good old days were so great, if you were to go in the past, you might say that wasn't as good as I thought it was. We need to just look to God at every point in time in life, don't we? And know that God has it all figured out. He even says you can't add height to your body by thinking about it. So why even try? Which of you can... By taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. Some of you have heard this illustration. Bear with me if you have. Some of you are new to the church and haven't heard it. My goal was to be six foot two inches tall when I was a kid. 
and I thought I had a good shot at it. My, my dad has tall brothers. My mom has really tall brothers. My dad is six foot. My mom, five eight. I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it, I'll, I'll surpass it. And on the edge of the door, I, I put a line at six foot two and I wrote Eric's goal when I was in junior high and I thought it won't be any time, I'll be there and I'll pray. I never got there. I wanted to, I thought by the power of positive thinking I could grow to six foot two inches tall and I stopped at five foot 10, a whole four inches short. And get this, it was really fun for me when I watched both of my younger brothers keep growing and keep growing and surpass the goal that I had for myself and now I walk around as the shrimp and they walk around as the giants. You know what I realized in all of that? God was in control. God had a reason for me to be five foot ten. I don't know why. I do know that last time my youngest brother, who's the tallest, and I went to King's Dominion, he had to get off several rides because he was so tall. And I thought, I'll be very thankful now that I have short, stubby legs. I can, I can ride all the rides. I don't have to be forced off. We can't make things happen by just thinking about it. It doesn't work out that way. We need to abandon ourselves. This is not about us. Here's the second thought, and I've already kind of touched on it, but assign it all to God. Just give it all over to him. If it really is in God's hand and God really is in control, we need to put 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 into practice. Casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he careth for you. Psalm verse 23 is a wonderful, comforting psalm. And we usually read it at funerals, but it's good for day-to-day -day living as well. The Bible says there in Psalm 23, beginning in verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We quote this in times of death. All of us at one point in time, at some point in time, are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you know what we're going to realize at that point in time? It's all in God's hands. My life is in his hands. But I do know that when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil. Why? Because the shepherd will be with me. He's going to lead. He's going to guide. He's going to direct. We might say that's a, a valley we have to traverse by ourselves, but we really don't. Because if we know the shepherd, he's right there with us. Oh, we might not be able to walk it right there with somebody, but if the shepherd is there and he's guiding us and leading us, we can trust him. And, and we quote that and we preach it and we get excited about it when we think about death. But let's live this according to life as well. Keep trusting the shepherd while you're alive. And it will be even easier to trust him when you're going through the valley of death. Verse 28 through 30 of our text they continue to expound upon the Lord as our provider, specifically for material things. He says in verse 30, If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? God has your day-to-day -day needs taken care of. We forget that, but God can clothe us, God can feed us. He can shelter us. I believe all of us have a place to stay. I believe we have a place to go with a roof over our head tonight. We should be very, very thankful. As God's people, we recognize none of this is because of us. It's because of God. God has provided all of these things. And the overall point that's being communicated here is this. Don't be anxious because of materialism. This is what the... People of the world live for. In verse 32, he says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. <clears throat> the lost in our world, they're the ones who get caught up with money and possessions. They're the ones who think that he who dies with the most toys wins. They're the ones who get caught up in housing and vehicles and, and all these physical things in this world that are going to soon pass away. 
And I understand we need a certain degree of those things to live in this world. But that's exactly what we do. We use them to live. We don't live for them. That's not why we're here. And the Lord can provide every material piece of clothing as well as possessions that we need. He does so for the lilies, the grass of the field, the birds of the air. And he'll do so for you. I think sometimes we jump ahead of God and we don't wait on him to truly provide something. And I would challenge you when it comes to material things, before you make a hasty decision, would you just wait and pray for a little while and wait for God to answer? Sometimes we think we have to do this or we have to do that. And, uh, you know, we've been through vehicles and housing in our family and God has always provided for us. And uh, you might notice my wife and I were driving both church vans. It's because we're waiting now because God's going to need to provide another vehicle for us. Our, our van is, is kaput. And uh, so but what do we do? Well, we're going to trust God to provide and God always does. Our place to live, God provides. And many times, here's how it's happened. It's been kind of interesting in our home. Our family will start praying, and usually we pray for about nine months. It's about the gestation period of a human. And I don't think that there, there's nothing doctrinal about this. I'm just saying in our experience, we start praying, and we pray, Sometimes it's about nine months. We prayed about nine months for the home we live in. God provided that. Uh, this church building, when we really prayed, every time I prayed to God, I mentioned, Lord, would you provide a church, a, a building for our church? We did that for nine months. And after nine months of doing that, the Lord just opened this place for us. And sometimes in the material sense of things, we just jump ahead a little too quick. We think we have to have that right now. Would you just wait and pray? You don't always have to have what you think you have to have. We believe it. We, we've been duped into thinking that we need something that sometimes we don't need. I can remember when our children were little and they would cry and fuss. And as toddlers, they'd fuss. And, and I remember Heather sometimes would say, don't listen to them. They, they're, they're, they're making you think they have needs that they really don't have. <laughs> uh, that was good. Sometimes we just need to let them cry it out a little bit. Sometimes they need to trust God. Sometimes they just need to learn a little bit about life. We as God's children need to do the same thing. Rather than fuss and whine and cry, say, Lord, I'm waiting. I'm trusting. I'm believing you to provide for my needs. And as you do, I'll thank you every step of the way. Here's the final thought, and that's this. Alert your focus to the Lord's kingdom. We're not living for this life anyhow. We're living for the next one. Everything that I've mentioned, material and physical things, that's, that's just all for us to subsist temporarily in a world that itself is temporary. He says, even what you eat and what you drink... Those things will become more scarce, I believe, in the days ahead. You can already go to the grocery store and see less on the shelves than you used to. Would you agree with me, those of you who go shopping? Okay. There's less there than there used to be. It used to be, <clears throat> and Heather does all the material shopping for uh, food and that sort of thing and day-to-day -day needs in our home, she used to be able to go to Walmart or a place and anything you'd need, it was just right there. Now, after shopping, she'll say, if I didn't buy this now, it might not be there for months. I, I, had, I had to get it right then, you know. Sometimes that's how things go, especially in these days. And I'm not trying to predict gloom and doom, <clears throat> and I'm not trying to worry everybody. I'm just saying, I believe our faith is going to be put to the test. Do we believe that God can provide for his children or don't we? Do we believe that God has it all under control or don't? Or we, do, or we don't. Let's give all of our focus back to him. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. <clears throat> and all these things shall be added unto you. We're seeking God and his kingdom and his righteousness first. 
Replace worry in your life with work. Sometimes when a message like this is preached, we might make the mistake of thinking, okay, don't worry, be happy. We all know the song, right? Do 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 That was the most encouraging message pastors ever preach. I don't have to do anything. I just go and just exist. I'm just going to do nothing and God's going to do it all. No, that's not what the message is. And that's not what the passage is communicating. Because <clears throat> it ends with this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. So that puts it all into perspective for us, doesn't it? The message isn't do nothing. The message is do everything seeking the kingdom of God. Keep your eyes on him. Now, you'll find out if you're going to truly seek the kingdom of God, it involves an all-out effort. Replace worry in your life with work for God. Work for the Lord. And as you work towards what God wants you to work towards, that's when he comes alongside and does what you could never do. Let's use the wisdom of God. We might not have things on the shelf, but we might be able to do a few wise things to make sure we're prepared. There's nothing wrong with that. We can balance this scripture with the passage in Proverbs that tells us, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Why? Because she gathereth her fruit in her season and stores. There's some wisdom in that. And that's working towards an ultimate end. I, I want to try to live as long as I can here on this earth. I want to be as prepared as I can here on this earth, not just for me and mine, but so that I can be of greatest use to God. It's all about him. It's all about his kingdom. So I'm not going to sit around and fret and worry and complain. I'm going to get busy. I'm going to give myself to what God has given me to do. And whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it mightily as unto God and not unto men. You see, I have something to live for. I'm here to live for the Lord. Busy Christians that live for the Lord don't sit around and do nothing. They're active. They're everlastingly at it. They're busy. They're keeping their hands moving and their hearts full of the grace of God and their, and their minds clear on the path that's in front of them for what God has for them to do. Connie Mack was one of the greatest managers in the history of baseball. And I don't know how many baseball fans we have, but in a bygone era, there was no manager like Connie Mack. He was just a wizard in how to manage and lead men and how to win championships and how to win World Series. Uh, he, he knew just how to provoke his players, how to give them the right time off, and all these things. But in the first three years as a Major League Baseball manager, his teams finished 6th, 7th, and 8th. And because of that, he took the blame upon himself. And he said, I have a lot to learn. And he demoted himself, and he went back to the minors so that he could learn how to handle men properly. And when he came back to the Major Leagues again, he began to handle his players so successfully that he developed the best teams the world had ever known up to that time. But he had another secret of good management, and it was this. He didn't worry. He said, I have discovered that worry was threatening to wreck my career as a baseball manager. I saw how foolish it was, and I forced myself to get so busy preparing to win games that I had no time left to worry over the ones that were already lost. You can't grind grain with water that has already gone down the creek. That's a good old-fashioned wisdom, isn't it? He said, if I was going to win games, I just had to get busy, focused, and working, and not worrying about why I last lost the previous one. We all take our lumps in this life, don't we? We all have things we wish we could have done differently. We wish could have changed. We wish it could have just been different than the way it turned out. But we don't have time to sit around and think about that and worry about that or worry about what might happen next. Let's get busy being prepared. Let's seek the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Verse 34 reminds us this future is not as important as the next future. Take no thought. Therefore, 
Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There's enough for today that can keep us busy about God's business. There's enough for today that we need to get accomplished. Let's not worry about tomorrow. Let's say, Lord, I'm going to focus on what you have for me now. And then when the next thing happens, we'll make a decision then. Sometimes the kids want, to, want me to answer a question right away. Well, what are we going to do uh, if this happens? And uh, when are we going to go here and do that? And I, I have a new saying I'm starting to use. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Or we'll, we'll decide when that time comes. And I say that to my wife. I say that to my children. Uh, I don't know just yet, but God will show us. And we'll make that decision as the time comes. Right now, we need to focus on what God has for us to do. Do you believe God has something for you to do? Oh, he sure does. And let's not get so caught up in the future that we forget about what's right in front of us. I, I can plan out and be a, a calendar planner and a person that thinks ahead. And that's good. It's good to plan. It's good to prepare. I will tell you this. After years of trying to put together calendars and planning and figure it out how it's all going to go, it never goes exactly as you think it's going to go. So plan, prepare, but ultimately leave it all in the hands of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, because ultimately you're either going there or you're not. If you're not, the best way you can get prepared for the kingdom of God is to get saved. That is, understand who you are. You're a sinner in need of a savior. Call upon him to save you. And when you walk through that valley of the shadow of death, you won't have to fear any evil at all because you'll have the shepherd right there with you. Would you pray with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're not sure that you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be a person who can live free of worry about the trivial things that the people in this world worry about. Because you'll have the shepherd, you'll have the savior. I think Satan wants to trick us into getting worried about things that just don't matter or so many things that don't even come to pass. Rather than living that way, would you just trust in Jesus Christ? If you need to trust him for salvation, would you call upon him? You can do so even right now in the quietness of this moment. And you can say this to the Lord. You can say, dear Lord, I believe that I'm a sinner. But I recognize that you died, were buried, and rose again for my sins. I believe that you were all God and all man. And I'm trusting in your death, burial, and resurrection to save me. And if you're here and you just prayed that to the Lord and just trusted in Christ, and you meant that prayer to the Lord as you said it, would you just raise your hand? No one's looking around. Just put it up and put it down. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you are claiming to be his child, that means that you've already made that decision and you're saved. Can I encourage you? Don't harbor that thing that you're hurting yourself with through worry and concern. Give it to God. The Lord knows. He knows everything before it ever happens in our life. And we need to release all to God. Some of us need to, this morning, just unload a burden. You're carrying a burden that you should not be carrying. Give that to God. You're not to live like that. Stress will eat away at you and it will hurt your testimony and it will hurt those around you. Release it. God can handle it. The Lord loves you. He knows all your needs and he'll supply them if you'll trust him for them. And even the things that we don't see happening right away, sometimes we need to wait and be patient. We need to know that God's in control. We need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And you know what will happen? 
He'll give you all those things you were concerned about in the first place anyhow. <laughs> maybe in a different way, maybe in a bit of a different fashion, but God's going to supply everything that you were spending so much time focused on before. Let's just get our focus where it needs to be. Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. I know I'm going to believe you. And I'm not going to sit around and do nothing. No, I'm going to get busy seeking. Seeking you and seeking your glory and seeking your commands. I want to live a purposeful life. Please help me to live that way, Lord. Father, I ask that you'd work in this invitation. Pray that you'd speak to hearts, encourage us through this. I pray that we'd draw close to you. I pray that you would lead, guide, and direct in each one of our lives. Lord, we can look to you and believe you for what you've said. Help us not to waste time on things that don't matter. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing for us and being a providential God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, quietly? I'm going to ask Holly to begin to play, and as she plays a verse or two of invitation, would you come? The altar is open. You come. As the piano begins to play, how has the Lord spoken to you? Maybe there's something we need to release to the Lord. Maybe there's something we need to give to God this morning. Why don't you come and kneel down and just have a word of prayer. Why don't you just trust God this morning and believe Him for what He wants for you. Amen. Well, it is good to be together this morning, and uh, what a blessing to be in God's house again and to hear the preaching of God's Word. And I want to encourage you, would you come back tonight, be here for the 6 o'clock service, and I want to uh, not forget to tell everybody there is choir practice tonight at 5, and we want you for the choir. We need you for the choir. I think I think the last two choir specials we had, and I, I'm not saying this just to say it, I think they've been our best. The choir has only gotten better and better. And part of the reason for that is because more and more people are lending their voice and their ability to sing to the choir. We want you. We need you. Uh, and so if you can come at 5 o'clock and help us to sing, it just makes it 
all together better. The more the merrier when it comes to choirs, okay? So uh, if you can come at five, we would sure appreciate that. And then we'll practice at nine o'clock next Sunday and we'll uh, sing in the morning service. We'll have our evening service tonight at six o'clock. We'll be looking at 2 Samuel chapter 17, uh, considering God's intervention and uh, the way the Lord intervened in a, just a, a way that only God could. And so I hope you'll be back for that. We'll look forward to being together again this evening. Let's be dismissed now in a word of prayer. Brother Steve Adams, would you dismiss us, please? Nursery meeting, about five, ten minutes.